Okay, it is Wednesday morning, July 31st. We've had about a full week of training camp. And it honestly feels like I've not been behind this microphone for a good, not eight days, but eight weeks. Because so much has happened. Before we get to that, I need to get to our guest. Who, I'll be honest, I usually introduce with a backhand compliment. Some sort of ball busting. <laughs> Might just take a straight out dig at him. But yeah. my guy is launching a new podcast today. He is recording it soon after this, I believe. He's on morning radio now a couple times a week. NBC Sports Boston every Tuesday. He has reported on the league for over 20 years, including a Matt Judon scoop yesterday that they are far, far apart, meaning Judon and the Patriots and the contract extension. And now here he is spending time with us, Mike Giordano. Thank you very much, <laughs> my good friend, for coming. Perfect. Back Mike, Gir- Mike Girardi. Yes, <laughs> yes. That, all those things. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. You know, um, very rarely do I say no to you. And usually the only reason I say no to you is, I mean, aside from the fact that I don't like you, is that I'm completely swamped. Um, but you're persuasive and here I am today. So uh, we'll see if this one goes badly. I don't know. Maybe you won't see me again. Yeah, as they say, they don't make them like the Giordano's. Um, so <laughs> here we are. Day six of camp was yesterday. It was a second padded practice. My line this time of year is often the trends will tell us the truth. Uh, we don't know anything yet. And, of course, we have phrases going around like panic meter or trade him with Matt Judon. And the offense sucks and deja vu and PTSD. And a lot of that is just like reactive, typically negative Boston, let's just, you know, attitudes. Because we can pin it on Boston sports media, which I think everyone understands is made up of different individuals with different outlooks. But gets broad brushed when the loudest mouths and the biggest names take the same approach every day of, Where can we tweak this team? And yesterday, because I'm just going to hit this right on the head, the lead topic on Boston Sports Tonight, which I did with Mike Felger and Michael Holland, you've done before, obviously, was Joe Milton looks better than Drake May. This is sensationalized nonsense. It's courtesy of our friend Ben Bolin, whose nickname is Trollin' Bolin. He got on the shows. (laughs) I just, we can dive into the numbers why it's not true, even though I understand watching how bad Drake has been the last couple of days. Some people might buy this, but it's just, it's not true. So take it from here. Yeah, so look, um, Joe Milton throws the ball at one speed at all times. So let's just start with that part of his game. And, you know, when if you did any research on him before the draft, I was down at the Senior Bowl, you talked to people like six years in college football. He's three years older than Drake May at this point, or two and a half, whatever the difference is. So you're like, he should be a little bit further along just based on experience and where he's been in college. But um, one of his big critiques is – the ability to process the game. So it's great that you have this physical tool and you're six foot, whatever, five, 240 pounds, and you you look like a, a great God. But to play the position, you have to be able to process the position. And they're not even really giving him many opportunities to do that. So when he does get out there and he does throw a laser beam, it's like, oh, my goodness. OK, well, he had like four reps. Yeah. But we, but what, are you, what are we talking about? How many reps are we talking about? Who is he repping against? Which is always a big thing to me. I know you can only play who's in front of you, so you can't give them demerits. But when you start talking about, well, this guy's better than that guy. Well, this guy's thrown against guys that are going to be working at Starbucks and Lowe's, you know, three weeks from now. Right. That's just but that's just that's the reality yeah. of it. Or, yeah. you know, like going to go play football in Canada and be lucky if they make a team there. Like that that's the reality of it versus you know, the situation that Drake's in. And look, that's not to defend Drake, and I know we're going to get into it, yeah. but, like, I, I just it, – it creates be, – because of the powers that be and the people that listen to, and you mentioned Felger and Holly, Felger and Maz on the, uh, from 2 to 6 is the show that really kind of drives the conversation. We could talk about, like, trying to be responsible journalists and let's, let's give it nuance. That show from 2 to 6 has a massive audience, and when they run with something, as they did yesterday with Volan's – headline and his story, then it becomes basically like prevailing opinion for everyone. And that we're all thinking that it's not true that we're not all thinking that as we're sitting here shooting it apart, but it does help influence the people that aren't there or just, you know, worship at their altar, which God bless them. I'm not knocking them. They've they've made a hell of a living and they're really good at what they do, but like, it's not the full reality of the situation. And it just leads to, um, it creates controversy that shouldn't be there. I mean, maybe controversy is not the right word, but like, oh my God, is Joe Milton really already better than Drake May? Did they really screw up the third pick? And should they have drafted Joe Walt or Malik Neighbors or Mark? Just freaking relax. No, I think go back to the, I think go back to the conversation we had beforehand yeah. too. Like yeah. this wasn't gonna be some immediate thing for Drake May. It was 
there were things that need to be worked on that are going to continue to have to be worked on probably for years. You know, that doesn't mean he can't play before them, but there's things that he's going to have to hone that, you know, quite frankly, someone who's been six years in college as Joe Milton probably shouldn't and won't. Yeah, I, I don't want to spend any more than two more minutes on this. I say it for the exact reasons you did, and I'm glad you laid it out. It's become a talking point. This is my ability to push back against that, as I did in the A block last night, being like, if you've actually charted every single rep, uh, who's passing? Who's catching? What was the route? Who is in defense? Was it the first defense, second, third, fourth string, whatever? You understand this is just not the case. So I, they, I say this to everyone to take a breath. It's not to say Drake has been good the last three days. He is not. But over those same last three practices, that would drive someone to say that Joe Milton, who's taken fewer than half the reps that Drake May has, but has the same number of interceptions as Drake May, has the same number of sacks in team periods, meaning he has a higher sack rate than Drake May does, and the same number of botched snaps while completing zero passes longer than 10 yards down the football field. It cannot possibly be true then that that quarterback uh, is outperforming Drake May, who granted has been bad, but is also flatly better the first three practices. So that's the case. We'll get into Drake May a little bit later. It's just not true. Can, can, I, give, can I give you one more on yeah, this? Yeah. And everybody everybody took their pants off for it, like fans, even media, and it was a, it was a phenomenal play. You're on one today. I, I love was, this. Keep going. <laughs> was, it, was it Friday when Joe Milton fr- – it was Friday or Sunday, the 60-yard bomb to Javon Baker, right? Oh, that, that, it was a sack. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was a sack. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I don't feel like a lot of the tweets of the people that you at home follow put that in there. So while it was great that the end result was a 60 yard completion, I, I, guess what? It never happened. The play never happened. And that's part of the, the difficulty of reporting on camp, right? Like I will check yes. with you sometimes. We ask on the Hill, what did you see on this? Yeah. Did so-and-so get For to sure. him? Because the players can't contact the quarterback. So sometimes they run straight by them. Other times they stop, go hands up. It's like, I got the sack, but I'm not going to break the practice rules of not touching the quarterback. In that instance, Joe Milton stepped through uh, like the, the Red Sea had parted. And the Red was not, <laughs> you know his non-contact jersey it was every other defender who could have grabbed him and thrown him to the ground that's that's all that there is so just relax uh the the machine is doing its thing but here we are pushing and fighting against the machine in this little ringy ding podcast now the, the way i really wanted to start the show is you know when i sent you this rundown yesterday uh before i got the rundown that threw my head into a tizzy briefly and then we didn't even i didn't even get to address the milton stuff so this is really just pent up yep. bs me venting out here your podcast you're allowed to 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 let it let it loose the question i had for you is this what is the best thing you've seen at patriots camp tumultuous start overall but the best thing you've seen through six days Hmm. oh come on mike you really have i i'm look Mike, I don't think that, I know. I don't think there's one thing that really jumped out to me and has been like, "Oh yeah, that's great. That looks wonderful." I mean, obviously, I think the the overall play of the defense, just the way they look, which, but I, you know, I kind of expected okay, that let me, going let me in. go I first and be a good host and, and buy you some. Yeah, time. go ahead. I don't have a. I I do have a play, but it's you know you have. I missed this question, by the way, in the rundown. Did you put this at the top? Yeah, of the yeah, rundown? it is at the top of the rundown. It's in bold, actually. So I'm just going to let you squint there. Oh, as God damn it! I looked at yeah, no, yeah, very, no, very good job right. by you. I got every I got every other one listed except for that one. Keon White. Okay, All it's right. not a play. It's not a day. It's not a position. It's not a unit. It's a player. This dude is ready to destroy every single thing in front of him. I'm talking about that as an edge setter against the run. I'm talking about as a pass rusher on the interior. I'm talking about one-on-ones where you might as well just exit stage left anytime you're across from him, whether you're a center, a guard, a tackle, because he is ready for his breakout year. And it's early, and we can do the small sample size thing. I am here to declare Keon White breakout year two is coming. In fact, it's already started. He's the only player so far on defense who has multiple sacks, multiple run stuffs, and has looked as good in one-on-ones as he has. Granted, offensive line, not very good. But he's also the only player doing this in multiple spots along the defensive line. He is the best thing I've seen in camp. And I was hesitant about crowning him year two, even with Gerard Mayo saying something in the spring and everyone going, oh, the year two lead, former second-round pick, yada, yada, yada. What I did say is we'll know early, right? He's an older prospect. The physical development is pretty much done. But he can refine his technique as a guy who converted from tight end to defensive line midway through college. And that development, that piece is taking off now. And I absolutely love watching it every day. Well, 
in my defense, though I did miss the question because I was bleary eyed when I looked at it. Uh, my two up, he's one of my two okay. up. Okay, so all right, good. I, we're gonna get to that. But like, he was the first name. That was a no doubt, no brainer. Like, love everything that he's doing. But I'll, you know, I, I will stick with my original answer. Just in general, like, the defense is good. We knew the defense was good. The defense has had largely dominated the first six sessions of practice and as it should be, they're going to, they're going to, again, as last year, they're going to need to be as good as humanly possible because I think points are going to be uh, maybe not as difficult to score as last year. Certainly not as difficult to score last year. I hope not as difficult to score as last year, but uh, they're going to be offensively challenged and the defense is going to have to carry the better portion of the day for 17 regular season weeks. When you crossed your fingers there with both hands for the YouTube audience and it looked like a couple of middle fingers, did you do that on purpose? What was <laughs> it's just, just, just oh, that, oh, yeah, did, yeah. that did look like this that. This is pretty dangerous. Wow. Yeah, we no, that that's out. that right there. See that? See, if I did that as opposed to this. Oh, I need you on Wednesdays now. And, 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 those, were, and those were for you. Can you way, stop just... sending flying those birds <laughs> in my direction, what? please? Um, we do need you every Wednesday, though, because you did radio yesterday, you did TV, you covered practice, you wrote, you reported, and you are as burnt as your face looks. And so this yeah. is just, this is great. Um, it's, it's raw Giardi. Yeah. Speaking of raw, <clears throat> just going to let that hang there for a second. Uh, Matt Judon, <laughs> okay. his, his yes. feelings right now mm -hmm. are at the forefront of the news, sticking with the defense, right? Keon White's been great. He's, he's on the edge sometime. Maybe he started opposite Judon early in camp, but yeah. he's getting more run, more opportunities, better looks, because Judon's gone. Um, the, the big news of camp, if you had to say, hey, what's been going on? Well, we had a player who was a full participant for four days and gave one of the more candid open press conferences we've ever had from a Patriots player on day one. And in that press conference, he says, I will practice. I've got to play under this contract. I signed it, and that's what it is. But please go talk to Elliot Wolf, Matt Groh. If you can, tell him to give me a little bit more money. Well, then on day five, when the Patriots put on the pads for the first time, a year after he never participated in padded practices. And I think that detail is being lost when he went head to head with Belichick and eventually got his new deal, revised deal, but never participated in padded practices. On day five, the pads come on and Matt Judon strolls on in street clothes and then talks with Gerard Mayo after sitting on a trash can and some mats as they're going through positional drills and leaves after about a minute. 30 minutes later, he does the exact same thing that he had asked the media to do. Goes and talks to Matt Crow and Elliot Wolf and confronts him with these wild gestures and is talking more directly to Grow. And after 10 more minutes, leaves entirely. He was not there yesterday, meaning Tuesday. Another full padded practice. Today's an off day. You have since reported that morning preceding the conversation, the Patriots were far, far, far apart with Judah. So I ask you this. A, do you have an update? If not, how bad is this situation really? The optics in the media stuff has already taken off. But with the actual yeah. relationship part of this, how much is the damage? And is there anything new? Well, let's just start with the idea that um, there's been some pushback from the Patriots that the that the media and and the fans are have pushed the animosity part of this conversation a little too far, and that it's not nearly as bad as you think it is. To which I would tell you, I didn't write about it because I believe it's just strictly damage control, like. It was an embarrassing moment for a lot of parties caused by Matt Judon, right? Like, let's put front and center. Matt Judon decided to behave in a manner that five days ago he said he wasn't going to behave. Uh, and he put a rookie head coach and a rookie GM um, in the spotlight. He did it publicly, which, you know, I don't care who you are. There's an element of being shown up there that doesn't sit well with anyone. So while again, they're trying to, as I, as I mentioned, they're trying to push back on it. I would tell you that if you really meant it or you really wanted to put a real voice to it, then Gerard May or Elliot Wolf would have been available yesterday or today on the off day to say, Hey, look, no, 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 no. You guys are getting this all wrong. It was just, you know, a passionate conversation, but you know, no harm, no foul. And we're just trying to work through things and we understand his frustration and we still want him on the team. We didn't, we didn't get any of that. Right. So the last 24 hours, they just they just let it fester. He's not at practice. Uh, he's not at the facility. Is it him who didn't show up or is it them who told him to stay away? Nobody wants to comment on the on the on on what side that is. So they're letting him sort of. For, for better, they're letting him kind of rot out there a little bit like, OK, you did what you did. And while we'll push back gently, we're not going to put a public face to this. We're just going to let it sit. So 
Um, look, the, unless something happened last night that I don't know about in terms of negotiations, the, the, the chasm between the two is so wide that I don't even know how you bridge that gap. Like it, there, there's no gap to be bridged because it's so wide. So the, the question is, in the, is Cooler Hedge prevail? Can you reach Judon or his agent and say, look, man, we'll give him a bump for this year. He's free to go next year. Like, let's get him to 15, $16 million incentives that maybe can kick him up to 20. Because as Judon has pointed out on some guy's podcast, who did an awesome job, by the way, I, I forget the name of the podcast, that he knows their salary cap figure. Like, he's he. this has sort of been, to me, a calculated approach. Oh, I'm going to be the good guy. Oh, here comes the podcast where I'm talking about their salary cap number and why aren't they going to give it to me? And I'm smart. I gave them the, I, I, I presented the numbers to them. I, I, I wrote up my, my agent says I could be a, an agent myself one day. <laughs> and then to this point where on the first day of practice, he's one of the first people up the stairs and he's wearing flip-flops, sweatpants, sweatshirt, baseball hat, phone in hand. I mean, the phone in hand, just for people like that's not allowed. There's, there's, you're not players are not supposed to be bringing their devices up there. Hitting pause and it on was that like, right away. Do you remember? Because this is my first year in the beat, 2018. Kenny Britt coming up. The yes. <laughs> there's, yes. When you when you're leaving the stadium the way the players do, there there's basically coming up a hill, right? And the far corner of the hill is the hill that everyone knows where they run sprints after practice and you know put it in the bank, and conditioning, yada yada. On the near side, that's adjacent to the actual stadium, is a super sized set of stairs that they walk up in their cleats. And right next to that is a VIP section often with player families and yada, yada. And this will be quicker than it sounds. Kenny Britt comes up the stairs one day. Instead of continuing up the stairs and onto the fields that are right in front of him, he takes a quick right, goes up to the VIP section and just kind of chills and has his phone. <laughs> Practice is going on. This is my second week covering the Patriots who are dealing with all of the Gronk stuff being traded, coming off the Eagles Super Bowl, yada, yada. Uh, no surprise, Kenny Britt did not really play for the Patriots. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was an odd duck. Uh, and that was Phone in hand. his reputation. Yeah, ap- reputation. But so to the Judon thing, it's like, okay, you're, you're already – and you know what? It, it's actually funny because I saw him with his phone earlier in the week too. So it wasn't the first time he did it. But at least in those instances, he was ready to practice and practice. This was a clear to me like, all right, time to escalate. Like, you know – uh, getting along, going along to get along, that that's not working anymore. You know, I was trying to present the good guy and hoping they would see I'm a good teammate and I'm out here working and even God shall was not doing as much as me. And, you know, like I just, I'm trying to put this out there. And then it was like, you know what? This is crap. You're here. I'm here. We're not getting any closer. I'm your best player. Now Barmore is out. Like I'm just putting it all out there. And it was a bad look. And it, it, uh, like I said, I think it, I wrote last night, it's kind of already an inflection point. You're, you're really a, a, not even well now we're a full week into football, not counting the OTAs, but like real football getting ready for the season. And you're already at this point for Elliot Wolf and Gerard Mayo. Like, what do you do? How do you handle it? And, you know, we're going to talk about it. Did did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Did they did somehow Judon get back in the fold? But then if they're 0 6, is he complete? you know, jack wagon again, like I, I, who knows how it's going to play, but it's going to be something that's going to be monitored and it's going to be something that's going to be attached to them for this year. So a couple things. Number one, the timing point you mentioned about when the podcast that Matt Junon, best I can tell, recorded about 10 days ago. So before camp, mm-hmm. there was a live show that he did with the Shut Up Mark, Mark with a C podcast. I'd never heard before this, uh, but you're right. He, they got him to talk in a way that was very open and, and honestly productive for people trying to follow this story and know how he feels and and why that podcast dropped eight, nine days later, right after this kind of show. I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. um, directly related to me. It would be strategic if he was intending to go and kind of make a mess as he did coming back to Elliot Wolf, but let's table that for a second. Number two, speaking of timing, all of this happens, not only in the day the Patriots put on pads when there's a greater injury risk for players like him and Gotcha, who also has an issue and whose agent showed up that same day. And it was just a really big, what the heck's going on? Uh, more right. weird and strange, though weird is now this kind of taboo word. We're just going to say it a bunch of times. Weird day <laughs> than really toxic, I would say. But the reason I bring up Barmore is because, of course, he's out indefinitely with blood clots. We, we wish him well. Glad they caught this very early. Blood clots took mm-hmm. out David Andrews for an entire season in 2019. I don't know what Barmore's timetable is, neither do they. But it struck me that the agent for one player 
who wants a new contract, suddenly descends on Foxborough the day after the only better defensive tackle on the roster is out indefinitely. So his client becomes much more valuable. And at the same time, Matt Judon, whether because they were in pads or because a podcast was going to drop that night, but is the only better pass rusher on the roster than Christian Barmore, now finally starts to make a mess, which really makes them, if that's there's a connection there, and I'm not alleging that there is one, but would obviously be in the best interest of business, uh, quite like a, a vulture, I would say at this point. And I give credit to the Patriots for just kind of sitting tight because the way I look at this is this. Yeah, the PR has been bad the last couple of days. They'll take the PR hit if it means they get a better deal in the long run. And if they keep Judon, just say, stay home. We'll figure this out. Unless you're ready to work, stay home. That's a win for Mayo. That's a win for Elliot Wolf. And ultimately, if they do trade him, it's a huge bummer. I would rather see Matt Judon play in New England. But time passing, everyone taking a breath. They're off today. We'll see what Thursday brings. I think yep. when we get some time in perspective, for now, to me, I still think this is more of a PR and an optics issue than Matt Judon's rankling the entire locker room, where no media member has been, by the way. So they're talking about a locker room divide. Right. They're making it up or don't know what they're talking about. Right. Because everyone else in the locker room either is behind Gerard Mayo, as everything we've heard since the spring, or has a contract extension. Yes. He doesn't have much leverage. Um, no, and I'll I, I'll shoot down the locker room thing. I don't think there's a problem in the no. locker room at all. Like they 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 had a bad year last year. They're hoping for a better year this year. Matthew Judon is, if not their best player, he's one of their two or three best players. And I think if you pulled the locker room, I'm just talking to guys privately, like they want as many good players as possible. Yeah. You know, like if you trade just, just a random, like if you go trade your first round pick next year for Brandon Ayuk, the locker room will be thrilled. They don't care about your first round pick. They just care. They want you. Know, give me guys. Give me dudes. You give me more dudes. We have a better chance to win games. Funny you bring so, up Brandon yeah. Ayuk for a first round pick. I think someone proposed a first round pick swap uh, fairly recently. Yeah, I, I, I think we texted about that. I, I don't. I wasn't. I, uh, I would have said no. To yeah, you. I think we just didn't text him <laughs> for a few days after. Um. Yeah, yeah. I think your feelings were hurt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 so. You bring up Wolf and you're talking about the PR and the optics of it. Here's my biggest thing. And one of the reasons why it bothered me as it did. And this is uh, a twofold. One, the immediate reaction was, aside from the people assailing Judon for his behavior, was, oh, he showed up male. And I actually thought, and again, without knowing full details of the conversation, that Gerard did his best to sort of settle it down. I mean, when, when Judon went over to the pads and sat on the, the blocking dummy, six feet in the air, uh, again, making a spectacle of himself so we all could see, and Gerard is standing inside him and he's got his mouth covered, it was a long conversation, not like the one on the trash can earlier. This was a longer conversation. It seemed a little bit less demonstrative. Um, but I think that put him in a bad spot. And what put him in a bad spot is not only Judon's behavior, but it's management. It's Elliot Wolf. And if you want to tie Robert Kraft into this, because in, in, he's the one who has to write the check. When last year, when they moved the money from Judon's contract in 2024, this year into 2023 to make him happy and end the holdout, yeah. hold in, they knew right away in that very moment, the clock had started on next year's holdout. So, okay, you go through a season. If Bill's here, do we think Judon's back? I don't know. I know some people have speculated he's gone. I think Bill kind of likes Judon, so maybe Judon was one of the guys that he'd reward. Regardless, new management gets in place, and they had months before the draft to figure this out. Are we close? Is there something that can be done? Is he part of our future? Or is he a one-year guy? And no, we're not really that close, so you know what? Screw it. On draft day, or right before the draft, we're going to spin him off for a pick. Someone who's looking for a pass rusher, instead of putting one in the draft, we're trading him at the draft. Well, let's they let's stay with the they, draft for a second because I, I want okay. to move on from Judon. But I, but I think the point you're getting to is a trade, right? Like you, you could have done a mm -hmm. trade earlier. You could have added an asset at the time yes. that you would have loved an extra draft pick. This is a rebuild. More draft picks, the better. But they just created this situation. They let this fester, and they know that they haven't been able to close the gap. They've made offers. They haven't, and he's here and they're here yeah. and they haven't even come anywhere close in the middle. So what did the, what's the calculus here? What did you think was going to happen? You think that you were going to make this guy play on $7 million ish, whatever the contract is 
did you think he was going to bend to you and just take the the sweetener or the the what he feels is a low ball offer? Like, if you know anything about Matt Judon, Matt Judon cares about his money, and I don't fault him for that. I yeah. care about my money too. Godchow cares about his money, but like, if he's not getting his money, he's not going to be happy. And if he's not happy, then you get what happened there. And again, now we're talking about that more than we're talking about football. And, you know, there's a lot of football stuff that's happened in the last week, too. Yeah, let's let's talk about the football really quick. I texted okay. uh, an NFC executive yesterday just, hey, you know, I don't know if you have any interest, but what, what do you think Drew Down would fetch in the trade market? He said a third round pick or equivalent to that really quickly. Would you take that deal right now? Oh, a third round pick in a heartbeat because I think it's more like a fourth or a fifth. And I talked to, well, I talked to a couple people league wide and like, it doesn't seem to be a, an, a, a, an inordinate amount of interest, you know, and I started to go down the list of like, well, who Chicago would be a team that I'd be going the phone with right now. Chicago wants a pass rusher opposite Montez Sweat. Uh, Austin Booker, who I love is a rookie out of Kansas, but he's a fifth round pick. He's raw. He's got 500 college snaps. Like that's a team that's trying to get to the playoffs that actually might have a window to get to the playoffs. Go Go trade for Matt Judon. Maybe they're a team that would say, okay, we'll give you that third or a fourth. But by and large, I think it's going to be like, mm, he's still going to be unhappy with his contract. Yeah. If we don't have any plans on extending him, why am I going to give you a day two pick? Breaking news. We've got a young, exciting, underdog team in Boston that's making a run for the playoffs. No, it's not the Patriots. Well, not the Patriots yet. It's the Red Sox. And if you've been following this season, you know that the Red Sox have been a hotter ticket Ever since the season started, I want you to get down to Fenway with Game Time, an authorized ticket marketplace in Major League Baseball, where you will find killer last-minute deals, all in pricing, including those pesky fees, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee. Guys, you've heard me talk about Game Time before. And look, whether you are in New England, whether you're down in New York, whether you're out on the West Coast, you can browse through the Game Time app to find any seat you want, customize your spot, flash deals, zone deals, I've done this before, gone to a Yankee series. You could go to a makeup date, whatever it is to get you back into baseball with one of the best seasons we've had so far, especially for the Red Sox. And you can do this, again, with the lowest price guaranteed. I don't care where you get your tickets, but they should be now with the Game Time app, which you can download right now. Create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. All you need to do is create an account and redeem this code C. L N S for $20 off your first purchase. It could be MLB, WNBA, concerts, etc. Just go to game time today. Find last minute tickets in the lowest price guaranteed. Christian Barmore. Uh, and again, folks wanting to get to more of the training camp stuff. We have a ton of notes. We have a lot more coming. So just, just hang in. It's just hard to get around the idea that through six days of training camp, when I said the truth is in the trends, we haven't had as much time to build trends yet. The best player in the team being in a contract dispute and showing up in a way that's unprecedented is going to get some airtime. So yes, here's where we pivot because again, there are ripple effects. You know, Christian Barmore is ruled out indefinitely on Sunday. Matt Judon does all this on Monday. Uh, Barmore has since been replaced in practices Monday and Tuesday by Daniel Ekwale, who I picked as kind of this like little bounce back breakout player a couple of months ago, but to me is not a starter in this league. And so I ask you. And then we'll get to Drake May and everything we've seen, what we like, what we want to see next. How do you replace Christian Barmore if we assume he's out for the season, which I think is has to be our baseline assumption in told world otherwise, because he's going to be on blood thinners. You can't play football on blood thinners, even as you're getting weaned off. Yeah. And then you got to build back up your strength and all these different things. My answer would be schematically. This is not a one-for-one one deal. And you can make it one-for-one one by replacing Christian Barmore in early downs. Be like, hey, Armand Watts. You played for the Steelers. You played across the defensive line. Before that with the Vikings, had like five and a half sacks. Um, that's great. Armand Watson, Devon Kajos, you're starting defensive tackles. Not enough pass rush for me on early downs when teams are really going to make hay. Good good run stopping. And then on third down, it's Daniel Ekwale, and then you're dipping into like Sam Roberts. You're going to kick Keon White inside, and then Anthony Jennings and Josh Juche, or maybe Matt Judon's back. I don't like it. My answer would be more single gap. I trust Armand Watts to get more of an interior push if he's allowed not just to two gap and hold up and face double teams, but if they play more four down, what do you think of that? And if not, what's your answer? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the way to go because I mean, forget about having someone who's even on the same level as Barmore. Like I don't, <laughs> I think there are multiple levels down to their, whether you're talking about Watts, whether you're talking about Roberts, Ekawali, any one of those guys that you're just, I mean, 
Christian Barmore was one of the best defensive linemen in football last year, and I think they were planning on him being even uh, a better player this year. So it, it's got to be scheme because from a from a skill talent perspective, you don't you don't have that. I think you can obviously on obvious passing situations, even if Judon is not here. I think you still have enough people that can go get the pass. You're, you're going to have to get creative. You're going to have some yeah. smaller guys on the field rushing the passer, but I think you could get by there. It's just the 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 early downs and obviously sort of the the attention that he commanded last year, especially as it went along, where you know two bodies needed to be put on him, and that's uh, th- that's tough to replace when all of a sudden now there's a free body because you're not really worried about getting beat by. Ekawale or Sam Roberts on a consistent basis. Yeah, and when I say play more four down, that's not just like a broad brush, simple wave a wand. There's a fix, right? I just think it yeah. alleviates pressure on players. You talk about Barmore was someone who had a gravity to him, right? He demanded double teams. He demanded, if we're talking about a receiver, a safety over the top. What the Patriots would do then and did towards the end of last season was work that against different teams who anticipated a double team and they would mm-hmm. draw and build their, their stunts and twists around okay, all the attention's going here. We'll have him loop around the opposite way and kind of have a pick set. These are not uncommon tactics, but when you can't bank on a team saying, we can't afford to single block him and then flip that against them, you need to get more creative. And I think just create more single uh, you know, blocking opportunities across the board on early downs and late downs because you are just not, you need as many guys uh, freed up on their own as possible when the talent is not there to say, oh, he'll win. Now you need someone to step up, probably on every different down, especially if Judon's not here. Uh, speaking of stepping up, Drake May, three straight below average practices. His completion percentage over the last three days, 53% in team periods. Hmm. It's about 60 for camp, a little bit over that. And this is a guy that I look at and say, okay, he's going through some growing pains. You know, like facing a projected top five defense is going to do that. Playing with a bottom five offensive line, missing David Andrews, by the way, the last two practices mm-hmm. is going to do that. And the receivers, we know what they are. What do you know about Drake May? What's your big takeaway just from watching him the last week? Uh, I think I wrote in the, as you did the fill in the blank, miles to go before he sleeps. Like there's, there's, look, there's, we knew that he was a uh, more on the raw side as a prospect and that there are things that needed to be worked on, particularly his base, his footwork and those sorts of things that I was encouraged by in the spring because I felt like every time we saw him in the spring, he was making steps in the right direction and i was like which kind of got me amped up here for the start of camp thinking like i don't know if he continues to make that sort of progress can he by the end of august is he really going to be able to challenge jacoby for the number one job and what we've seen here is a guy whose head is swimming um which has led to bad footwork which has led to slower processing which has led to inaccuracies and i don't think any of those things are are things that can't be overcome because then you see moments where, again, it does come together and it is a quick release and the ball's where it's supposed to be and it's thrown with great velocity. And, you know, there was a play yesterday. It was in team. It ended up as an incomplete pass, but he was flushed. He went to his left. You know, he flipped his hips and he threw a rocket to Jalen Polk. It was a little high yep. as, as Polk was coming on the cross. Polk should have caught the ball. Like, that's a... If you want to be a number one or number two or number three receiver in this league, Jalen Polk, you're a second round pick. They believe that you can be that. Then you have to catch that ball. And I was like, okay, I took hard in some of the incompletions during that drill where I think he was one for five or one for six, that there were a couple balls that he put in receivers that receivers should have caught that didn't. Um, But it's just not been consistent enough. Um, And I, I, you know, I guess it's the, you you have to preach patience. And here's the other problem is now I'm getting a lot of people asking me, well, Mac Jones, Mac Jones, Mac Jones. I'm like, right. Mac Jones was billed as what? The absolute opposite of Drake May, not a physically gifted player. Drake May, extremely physically gifted. Drake May raw needs work on footwork and needs, you know, work processing. Whereas Mac Jones came out with the computer brain, blah, blah, blah. His brain was a superpower. Turned out, by the way, his brain wasn't his superpower because he made so many dumb throws in years two and three that I I lost count. Um, But that's just sort of where we're at right now. And I guess guess I'm a little disappointed just because I thought, based on what I saw in the spring and knowing the work that he put in between the spring and getting ready for camp, that we would see even more of a jump. We haven't. So, okay, it's, you know, stay six. And we had a measured way to look at that progress, right? It wasn't just what you were writing, what I was writing, what, you know, anybody else was writing. Oh, Drake May looks better and better. He leapt Bailey Zappi in the pecking order, going from number three to number two, which then begs the obvious question, can Drake May jump to QB1? And right now I would just say flatly, 
Jacoby Brissett's lead has grown over the, the first six yes. days of camp. And that I don't think is terribly surprising. I think I, if I had to predict, I would have said it would have stayed steady over the first six days. Then Drake, as he gets adjusted to the you know, speed and the padded practices and, you know, the defense spinning the dial a little bit more, um, not to mention, again, the injuries around him, then he would start to make it up around the first and second preseason game. We're not there yet. We do have about nine to ten practices left, all three preseason games. And to me, for Drake May, not only just to want to see tangible progress, like better than 53% where he's been the last three days, uh, which I will I will repeat. Same number of interceptions Joe Milton, who's had fewer than half of the attempts that Drake May's had. Same number of sacks, so Drake May's still been better. But I just want to see him play a little calmer from the base up because I think that's going to translate to everything down the field where it's not that he's – Gun shy. He's going through his progressions. I mean, I, I wrote that he was gun shy yesterday. I should, I should, I should stick by that. But he's only had three days out of the six, Mike, where he's made multiple passes longer than ten yards down the field. This is a cannon strapped, athletic, creative, off platform thrower. The issue is when he doesn't have his feet set and he knows his his arm is you know coming, um, or his arm is ready to deliver and the pressure is coming. He will just go straight into whatever is most comfortable, whatever arm angle, wherever his feet are or aren't, and just try to get it in there. That's not going to work consistently right now. And so then once I think his feet calm down in the pocket or sliding away from pressure, everything else above the waist is going to follow. I don't really care about the arm angle as long as it gets there. But if the feet are off, that's what's leading to, I think, these errant throws. Um, And I think a guy who's dealing with a lot because, again, you know, it it just – Imagine the difference between having two feet on firm ground and land versus feel like you're trying to throw a football on a ship out in the middle of the ocean. Like that's what Drake May looks like right now. Yeah, you and I are having this conversation because I did write something about his again, sort of. It's become like an over reliance on the three quarter arm angle stuff that's kind of driving me nuts because they're. The, what's frustrated me is like receivers open in the flat. I know you're you've had a rush, but there is no rush here. Just turn your feet, plant, and throw. You're going to hit that 99 out of 100 times. Instead, to your point, things are so fast for him right now that, oh, it's open. And instead of setting his feet, creating that nice base and foundation, he's just, boom, three quarters. And then the next thing you know, he's throwing a you know a cutter or a tail, the ball's tailing away, and he misses the receiver by two feet. And you're like, Bro, it doesn't get any easier than that. In fact, in this league, the, you know, as we, we say, the windows are very small. And when you have a window that's open like that, you have to hit those throws. You just have to. And, and he has in, he has consistently missed those throws thus far. And again, it's 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 not because he doesn't have the arm talent or the brains. He just everything is going like this. Yeah. It's too fast. And he, he until he slows it down, we're going to continue to see those sort of erratic throws and erratic behavior overall in terms of his body and where his feet place. Yeah. The erratic behavior, I think we can safely say belongs to Matt Judon. The erratic play is a little bit more. (laughs) Yes. Drake May's uh, domain. Yes. Erratic behavior with his legs. I didn't mean his head. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling about, uh, look, I I just want to see him throw downfield a little bit more. I want to see him be calmer in the pocket. I a million percent believe Drake May will be better as we close out this week, practices Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't know when the pads are going to come on. I don't even know if the Patriots have made that determination yet, coming off of two straight practices into an off day. Uh, moving on, stock up. You teased this already. Keon White was one of your two players, that guys that are surprising and or impressing you so far. I am going to answer my own question with a question. <laughs> Ready? Sure. I'm yes. a jerk. Uh, <laughs> Mike... Who do you think is leading the Patriots in catches during team periods through six days of Patriots training camp? Tyquan Thornton. No. Solid guess, though. Not even Austin the right Hooper. position, though. Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper. 11 catches in team periods no. for Austin Hooper. A couple things on this. Uh, number one, they have been playing a lot more two tight end personnel, specifically with Jacoby Brissett, when they start these seven on sevens and 11 on 11 periods. This is not two tight end sets. Uh, as I talked about last week with Duck Hyde, that's going to inspire any comparisons to past Patriot offenses, uh, which more recently flopped when being compared to the original two tight end offense. It's just yes. something to keep in note. Behind him, reminder, Stevens has 10. Hunter Henry has nine. Jalen Polk and KJ Osborne both have eight. Hooper is both someone that both the quarterbacks trust in the flat as a check down option and someone up the seam. I think he's solid. I'm not projecting a even 600-yard season. 
but just he's looked better than I thought he would. Yeah, he has uh, good hands, a uh, good sense of how guys are playing him and how to utilize that his leverage versus theirs. Um, you know, look, it, obviously it's some years removed now, but he was a huge force for Atlanta and signed a massive free agent contract when he left there and then sort of has become a bit of a journeyman. I believe it was his fourth team in four years, but he's a pro. It's like, I don't, I think, I think I wrote this in the preview. He's not going to, there's nothing that he does that's going to wow you. Whereas, you know, Gusecki, obviously last year, even though, as we talked about, often he was more receiver than tight end. For, in fact, he, he was a receiver. And anytime they tried to have him block at the, you know, <laughs> at the at the strength of the play, it was an absolute debacle. Um, Hooper's not that that problem. But that there is there is sort of safety in that. Like, I, I know what he is. I, I'm pretty certain I'm going to get the same type of effort and performance from him week after week. And I think that's beneficial for a team that's obviously been riding a roller coaster uh, offensively, period, and, and even at that position at times. So uh, it, he's been a nice little ad for, for, for very little money. To your point, he's not, he's not catching 60 passes. I, I'd, I'd be shocked unless something happened to Hunter. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice little piece to have. All right, you already teased Keon White. We talked about him. Uh, who is your second player as far as stock up so far early in camp? So this might surprise you because we've talked about how the offensive line has been erratic and maybe has only had, I don't know, one one good day out of six. I, I'm going to say Caden Wallace. I've seen enough Fair. with Caden Wallace in moments. Again, not it's not a consistent thing where I say to myself, oh, you know what? They may be right. He may be able to play left tackle. Um, and obviously that's where he's settled in here in the last four days as they've sort of established for the first time a semi-consistent five. I mean, obviously without David Andrews the last two days, but he would be in there uh, were he not away from the team. So um, I think he has a chance. I think he's strong. I think he's smart. Uh, and I think he seems to be someone who's embracing the Scott Peters, the strike system that, that – uh, some of the nerds are really getting oh, into. Oh, come on. Don't do that um, to Taylor. Uh, Taylor. To, to, to keep, Taylor has to keep his pants on when we're talking about strike systems. Um, That's fine. You've used that line so, about pants on or pants off, I think, mean, three times now on the podcast. Uh, well, look. Two dollars. Just, yeah, okay. That's fine. That's fine. All right. But you owe me like six beers, so let's just take it off my tab. That's true. Um, <laughs> so I, I – I, I, I wasn't sure about him in the spring. I was like, oh, God. And, he kind of, and they kind of, as the spring went along, they kind of went away, at least when we were there, from seeing him at left tackle. And I'm like, oh, so you talk about him being a possible left tackle, but now you've already made the determination that he's got to stay on the right side and he's not even with the ones that nest, you know, consistently in the right side. And again, rookie, so you're still waiting for development. But then that he's gotten to this point and that I've seen signs and I've seen him pick up some stunts, you know, during team period, I'm like, okay, I think. I, I feel better about that pick and his capability of maybe making the switch. Cause I think athletically you see like there's, there's a good skill set there with that player. We talk about measurable ways uh, or, or ways to measure progress, right? For Drake May it was going from QB three to QB two in the spring. Caden Wallace is going from right tackle with the second and third team to the first team left tackle after two practices and then staying there for the last four days mm -hmm been impressive because we know they're going to rotate. I would not expect him to stay there for the rest of training camp, but he stayed there longer than we saw Calvin Anderson, longer than we saw Chukumo Korofor, okay, who's back at right tackle. And that's encouraging. Like, that's what they're doing. They're saying, our first team offense, we're going to put a third round rookie at left tackle. He's not played there. I see the strength. I see the movement. I just know the history of rookie offensive tackles. I don't care where you were drafted or how high. It's not good. And so it'll take some time, right. especially with the transition, but I am a little bit higher on him than uh, I expected to be. So I'm with you there. I have another rookie offensive lineman, though. And this isn't so much Ooh. in team periods because, again, we're looking at the ball, who's throwing, who's catching, what's the route, you know, was there any kind of pressure? But Layden Robinson has been a right guard every single day with the second team. And when they go into one-on-ones, this dude not only, like, sprints to the line, whatever they have set up on the far end of the field where you can see them go, you know, snap the ball and there's an, a line of offense and a line of defense and one guy will rush against another whose job is obviously to stop him. Lane Robinson is sprinting in and out of this drill. When he's in the drill, he is – okay, this is a nerd moment for me. 
anyone who's watched Dragon Ball Z or has any sort of idea of what like throwing energy or air or uh, I don't even remember the term. Maybe I'm not that big of a nerd. He stunned with one hand Dietrich Wise in a way that I thought I only saw in cartoons during one on one pass rush. Like put the hand to the chest and Dietrich Wise went backwards, stumbled backwards in a way that was like, did he not expect that to happen when the whistle blew? Because that's how strong this dude is. And I wrote earlier this yeah. season, he's had shades of, of Shaq Mason. He was 3 0 1 1 pass rush yesterday. He was 2 and 1 the day before. These are small individual drills, but the way he's built, especially for a player who, where pass protection was his weakness, I would say, in addition to the penalties coming out of college, that's another one we go. I was, I was pretty critical of the pick. I'm not coming around just yet, but I'm more open to it because he's, he's taking care of business. Yeah, he, he is. He's again another. He's he's an impressive dude. The strength matters. Uh, t- to your point, City So did the same thing. I, and I'm, I'd have to check my notes again. He did it to someone where it was a one handed thing, and he just boom, yeah. stopped him. Great and system, he actually baby. said, "We talked." <laughs> yeah, well, we talked to him afterwards, and he was like, "Yeah, he was like, I couldn't believe the play was over. You know, one shot, and I was like, wow, I won the play. You know, like, get, got you know, all right, I like that." So uh, Scott Peters giving them some more tools to work with in the, in that bag. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. Like I, I, I mean, I look, I like the draft class so far. I mean, it's not, obviously it's not been consistent, you know, the, the Polk and Baker, there's been some ups and downs yeah, and, 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 and Drake heads the list. And obviously he's been um, not what we're hoping for just yet, but like there, there's some pieces there that looks like some of these guys can play and play and contribute this season. And that's, obviously pretty important as you're trying to build this thing and build this offense from the, from the ground floor. All right. We got to zip through the next eight minutes here. We have two stock downs. Scott, this is, you know, players who are surprising us are underwhelming so far. We, I've, I've written a lot about Javon Baker and Jalen Polk. Jalen Polk had the play of the day yesterday. He led uh, all catches, all players in catches during team periods with four, you know, he gets an honorable mention. Baker does too. He's been more flash in one-on-ones and had the bigger plays, the better plays. But consistency day to day has not been there. Two of five on targets and team drills on Monday goes down to I think zero of two on Tuesday. So if you want to know how I feel about Javon Baker, see the tweets, read the stories. Uh, I'll add Alex Austin in there. He's tied for the team lead in pass breakups through six practices. Everyone's favorite sleeper sleeper uh, here in the roster. And Dietrich yep. Wise has been solid. Two pass breakups, a sack, aside from getting blasted by Layden Robinson, who is now making me realize that the Dragon Ball Z reference is the only thing that's going to be populated in the YouTube comments and any replies to the tweet when I send this podcast out, as opposed to the 50 minutes of talking mostly football. Um, two <laughs> Way to two go. stock down for you, and I bet we're going to overlap at least on one, if not both. Oh, I, I bet you we don't. Oh. Josh Uche, Bailey Zappi. Okay, so we do have one. Uh, Josh Uche. Okay. Four days in, I'm going, Where where has he been? Um, I, I see him yeah, on field. That's what I, that, it, he's, yep. he's just invisible. And then the next day he goes over three and one-on-ones and gets kicked out of practice for fighting. Yesterday he had a would-be yep. sack, but that's it for me. Like I, I'm, I'm fully with you on this. So take it from here. One of our bold predictions on Boston sports journal. I said, I can't quit you, Josh. Uche. <laughs> I, 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 I was just thinking like, all right, well, if again, this is before Judon pulled a stunt, but I'm like, well, if Judon's back on the field and Barmore's on the field, like I, I think that, Gerard has the relationship with Uche that, like he said to him, we didn't use you properly last year. We're going to give you more opportunities. And I'm thinking if Judon's out there and Barmore's out there, he's going to get single blocked. And he beats, he with some consistency, he can beat those guys. So I'm thinking like double digit sack guy. And I am just been underwhelmed by the level of play thus far. And um, I think we we're supposed to we scheduled to talk to him maybe once or twice so far. That hasn't happened right. yet. I'm just kind yeah. of, yeah, I'm just kind of curious to see where his, his head is at. Um, and then on Zappy, like, look, man, body language is terrible. Uh, I get it to a certain degree. I do. Like, you know, we talked to him in the spring. You know, they told me I'm going to be – I'm in a competition. And then he probably felt like you moved Drake ahead of me, and I'm not sure that Drake outplayed me. So why am I still here? And I think now it's very much the vibe is why the hell am I still here? You know, like hands behind the back, just kind of like – going through the motions. And like I said, I kind of understand a little bit of the frustration here, but dude, you're not so good that you can pout. Like, I mean, I guess, guess if I'm him, I'd be going up the, to the back stairs to, to, to Elliot Wolf and Matt Gross saying, why am I here? Cut me, trade me. Can we, can we just do this? Cause this is, this feels fruitless. 
I would say he got the big win of his career when Mac Jones got traded and he got to stay put. Uh, so anything after this is almost gravy for him, knowing yeah. how their yeah. relationship either never existed or just completely disintegrated in 2023 when they were uh, avoiding each other in team hotels on the road, maybe even not taking the same elevator when possible. Uh, things you hear. <laughs> anyway, my second was Juju Smith-Schuster. I say this is someone who was low on him to begin with in camp, reported a year ago. The knee was not 100%, has never been 100%. Uh, we saw it in the season opener, right? The calm. A lot of people were upset that I said he wasn't. You know, he was signed to be a number one. That was the money they gave him relative to the rest of the receivers. Yep. Right now, they don't even see him as a number five when you include running backs and tight ends as potential targets. And that's only played out since. And I don't see a better version of him through six practices. Had a drop yesterday. A couple of catches, to his credit. One-on-ones uh, separating laterally or with his long speed. It's just not happening. He's a bigger body. Yeah. But for a team that's going to undergo a youth movement, I my bold prediction at the Boston Herald was I think they would eat the money and cut him at the end of camp yeah. because you just you just can't trade him. Uh, I don't think you have any disagreement there. No, no. I mean, I could have easily put him on the list, uh, so obvious. but I just I don't I just don't. Well, I just don't expect him to be. To your point, I don't expect him to be here. I, like I think there was a practice, maybe it was Friday, where I just I I think I turned to to Andy Hart from WEI and I was like, just cut him now. Like, what are we like? And and it's not for effort. He's giving effort. Yeah. It's just the body is the body is unwilling. Jacoby Myers said it at the Super Bowl, right? Like, you know, the league caught up to him physically. Like he just he, he's not the same guy because of the, you know, the punishment that he's taken and and the shape that his knees are in. And, you know, I asked him yesterday, he still insists that that hot thousand yard receiver is in there. I, I don't know where he's getting a thousand yards. You know, maybe in flag football, I just, but not in the NFL. Yeah, walking to and from his car uh, before, before <laughs> and after uh, practices and That's games cool. this season. Uh, that was hard. But no, his, his knee has betrayed him. And it's a bummer because he's yeah. still only 27. Something that uh, someone told it's me crazy. the other day. And I was like, That's just, come on, just yeah. double check that. Uh, no, he's 27. He got drafted when he was 20 at a USC. And um, yeah, his best is behind him. And it's just, it's been even worse for a guy who, you know, tried to sell us in the spring. Like, he's 100% rested up. Watched uh, Bridgerton, um, your favorite show, I know. And uh, now he's back yeah, and looks like the same fair. guy. All right, uh, two quick thoughts. One non-nay yes. offensive thought, and then a non-Judon slash Barmore thought on the defense. I would just say, you know, obviously spent a lot of time watching the wide receivers as they've tried to rework that room. And I would just say there's just a, there's a level of inconsistency there. You know, uh, Baker has his moments, had two practices in a row where people were, I'm not going to say it because I've already said it three times, people were excited about his performance. <laughs> and then yesterday he had zero burst. Like one of the things that that I liked about him early in camp is when the ball was in the air, there were a lot of times where he was even with the defensive back. And then when the ball got in the air, he was leaving the defensive back. And he made, like, you had this little burst, a burst, by the way, that I haven't seen from Polk, which is a little slightly concerning for me. Um, but then yesterday he didn't have it. So maybe just dead legs, but he, he didn't, he didn't track down some balls yesterday. They had been tracking down prior. Polk has done his best work. It feels like within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. And when he does get open down the field, the window is small, which again, it's this league that's this, but we've seen like Baker will pull away from a guy and create a couple yards of se separation. Taekwon will do that. Polk is more of it's a, he's going to be more of a technician, I think, and it's going to have to be um, one with sharp cuts um, and winning, you know, more competitive type situations. And I think he has the hands to do that. I think he's a strong hands. I think he goes back to the ball very well. But again, just a little bit inconsistent and and not having pop out there certainly has changed the equation. He finally got out there in the red non-contact for his first seven on seven, but still hasn't participated in team unless I missed something. And that's. He's the guy that gets open in a phone booth and he's probably going to be the guy who eats most of the targets, you know, so that's not having him out there sort of impacts the way you look at everyone else. I've been sort of eh on KJ Osborne. I think he's fine. Yeah. I thought the signing was fine. He's a professional, but like he's not someone to me that you're going to feature in any shape, way or form. And the one thing I will give you, and I, I guessed incorrectly on Thornton is that there have been some Taekwon moments and, you know, we've been through this before with him in the, in the, in the early parts of summer, and he's got to carry that through, but the speed's still there. And like that to me is if he, if there's a little bit more consistency in, in catching the football and knowing where he's going, which thus far, I feel like he has shown that consistency. 
then he'll make a he'll make a case to be on the roster when when all said and done. Yeah, right now I have him on the roster uh, in my unofficial fifty three man that I had to rattle off my receivers last night in BST off the top of my head. Thought I got to five, and turns out I had six. And then Felger said something about counting on his toes, to which I said, "What? Why? Why? <laughs> What's going on there?" <laughs> Uh, but also, Was, did you have Kesh, you have Keshawn on no, or off? No, off. I, I just I I get that people want him to be on. I understand we're still hammering the 2020 LSU freshman year production. He's a six round pick so. who's looked like it was a healthy scratch for more than half of last season. Uh, has not separated himself this summer from within a bad receiving group. The flashes are few and far between. And when you talk about Tyquan Thornton, he's had the flashes that we've seen before, but also been more consistent. Like this is a guy who's getting about two catches per day. And there are some players, including KJ Osborne, who have gone over in certain practices. And that happens. It's training camp. Osborne, uh, the way you described him, is kind of like, you know, the guy your sister brings home. Uh, not, not my sister, just generally like, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, they're 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 nice. Like, they're fine. Like, what do you think? He just, okay. You know, like, that. that's what it is. Yeah. You know, KJ's like, fine. He's been okay. If you were just. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate him. I just, I don't. And yeah, it's just fine. He's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, I would say this, too, for people who are upset, we're not doing a lot more Javon Baker and a lot more Jalen Polk. Giardi and I are not here to hype up the rookies. Like, we're not going to be tweeting, this dude is a problem after six <laughs> days of camp and only two in pads. Uh, you need to see it a little bit more. Polk has been steadier. Yeah. Happy with him. Yep. Baker has had the better flashes. He moves different than the rest of this group. That's a fact. And I'm excited. Yep. Yep. You got to earn it. And no one's earning anything mm-hmm. this early in camp. Now, I will say, next episode, we will talk a lot more about the rookies. My non-May offensive thought was the run game. Excellent on Monday. First day of pads was like, uh, you guys, the, the offensive line's banked up and doesn't have one mm-hmm. reliable center. I couldn't tell. Uh, granted, Barmore was out. Gotcha was in and out of team periods, even though some people wrote that he was non-participant in contact drills. Not true. <laughs> Participated Monday and Tuesday. And um, Tonio Gibson looks great. That dude's only been back for the last three days. I like what I see. Him and Stevenson, I don't think, can really be on the field together at the same time and pose as much of a threat as people might be inclined to believe. But I'm very intrigued by that one-two combination because he's been really, really good. Um, let's just grab the defensive thought because we did a lot on, on Judon Barmore and talked about Keon, a little bit of the corners. But uh, unless you're really itching to share that with the people. No, I, I was just going to say, and I, I sort of touched on it earlier, Just I, there's a lot on them. Yeah. <laughs> there's and 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 now – the pressure grows with the Judon situation and how that's going to be handled. And obviously, you know, the likelihood that Barmore is certainly not around in the short term, but, you know, maybe not around for the entire season, depending, you know, again, we don't have full details and nor do, nor do they in terms of, you know, how that's going to play, but those are two massive pieces to the puzzle. And if the offense is going to be fighting to just be competent, the defense, if you're going to stay in games, is going to have to be, you know, as good as they were last year. And I, you know, that's, that's a lot to ask yeah. uh, in back-to-back years, especially uh, this year when you look at the schedule and the, you know, at least the healthy quarterbacks, if, they, if those guys are playing and some of the receivers are playing, it's going to be a massive challenge for them. Uh, f- far greater challenge than they faced last year. Way off the radar, backup linebackers, O'Shane Ziminis, William Bradley King. I think one of those dudes is making the roster. I don't, I don't know who it is. Both the flash the last couple of days in pads, pass breakup, sack for Ziminis. Uh, repping with the first team defense in spurts, but they're going to flash in the preseason. And I, this is my <laughs> super bold lane prediction. Fan base is going to be in on one of them. We're all going to look up again, as I did before the show, how to pronounce Ziminus or go, Oh, Bradley King, where's he been? Second year player. We'll see what he does. But I think one of those guys making the roster, partly because of special teams, which we did not talk about at all. All right. I got to go. That was, um, that was a deep cut. I, that's what we have here in the pod. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say it was anything but lame. Uh, a little bit bold. A little breaking news for you as we go out. And we're not going to talk about this. I just want to let everyone know. Bill Belichick is co-hosting and co-producing a new football show on the Underdog Media Network. Yes, Bill Belichick, famous for once dismissing fantasy football is, I don't know how he put it, but it was a regular Bill snort and dismissal, is now working for a fantasy company, Underdog Sports, to co-host and co-produce a show in addition to being on Pat McAfee. In addition to doing the Manning cast, in addition to being on Inside the NFL, I love this turn for Bill. It's something I could never have seen coming as much as we knew he would pursue media. Um, He's somehow busier than you and me. And uh, 
He's making a lot more money than us too. Yeah. I, I believe I would bet you that underdog fantasy thing pays pretty, pretty well. Makes you think, ah, you know what? I could get behind this fantasy football stuff after Especially all. Especially when they have to explain to him how does this air on YouTube? They just have videos. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, Bill. It's uh they're they're live now and people watch as yeah. much as they do cable. Yeah. On the YouTube. Uh yeah. The- the tube face anyway mike Giardi, thank you excellent as always i will see you on that sweaty media hill thursday for practice day seven of patriots training again all right brother